Hi, this is Caroline Lewis with a special announcement. Our Working Preacher Fall campaign is in full swing, and we are so grateful to each and every one of you who have given so generously already. Working Preacher relies on donors like you to provide quality content week after week. When you make a gift before November 30th, we will send you a free ebook titled Youthful Sermons. Youthful Sermons is a workbook to help young people preach their first sermon with mentoring from their pastor. Go to workingpreacher.org today to unlock your gift and support this important resource for preachers around the globe. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text for November 14th, 2021, the 25th Sunday after Pentecost, are these. The first reading is Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The semi-continuous reading is 1 Samuel 1, verses 4 through 20. Our psalm is Psalm 16. The second reading is Hebrews 10 verses 11 through 14 and 19 through 25, or you could read through uh, 11 through 25. And then our gospel is Mark chapter 13, verses one through eight. So this is our last Sunday of Mark. Uh, we are saying goodbye to the gospel of Mark uh, and moving on to, we have a, a lection from uh, John for Christ the King, and then we move into the year of Luke. So I point that out because uh, not that your sermon needs to do a, okay, here's where we've been and let's just walk through Mark again. But it's, I, I think there does need to be some uh, homiletical sensitivity or, or reminding of, of what is, what has Mark, uh, what has Mark revealed for us this, this past year? What has, how has Mark been our companion? Uh, and here we find ourselves, you know, in, in the apocalyptic discourse of, of Mark. Uh, and, uh, but, but where have we, where have we been in Mark? And might this be a place particularly as we are landing here in this, uh, in this section of Mark, what has Mark revealed uh, to us uh, in, um, in this past year. So that would be the first thing I would have a preacher think about. Not that, again, you don't have to do a whole history, but yeah. Yeah, the, the public ministry in Mark begins with a bang, right, right out of the gate with, uh, with the baptism and the descent of the spirit and bam out in the wilderness. And the public ministry ends here in Mark 13 with a bang, uh, with yeah. the statement. And you have to, you have to fill out a little bit about what's coming after this in Mark 13 verses nine and following, but this is not a gospel that was ever meant to help you get your balance or to help you feel safe and secure in the world. Uh, and if you don't believe me, read Mark 16, one through eight again, right? This is a gospel that's about new possibilities. It's about a chaotic world. Um, again, if it's written right around the war, somewhere around the year 70, it's written in the midst of great confusion, probably great distress, great worry. Where is Jesus? When is he coming back? How are we supposed to live? And this is one place where Mark says, keep your seatbelts on uh, during the, you know, the duration of the flight for your own safety. And that's, that's not because Mark doesn't believe that Jesus is important or powerful or consoling. It's just the life of discipleship looks a lot like the life of the road to the cross. And um, your job is to continue to bear witness, as Jesus will say later on in chapter 13. And here we are uh, in the midst of a very similar disruptive life, a very similar chaos, a very similar questioning of where is God? When is Jesus returning? And we could be distracted as this particular text points uh, directly to what's going to be the sign are we seeing those signs right now and uh, I'm, I'm struck by uh, the the last verse of this particular reading all of the things that are going on not just what were going on then when this was penned but what is going on now in our lifetime is yet 
the beginning of birth pangs. It's the beginning for us. And we miss the opportunity to live out the gospel, to be faithful disciples, if what we're doing is trying to put the puzzle together and figure out what's the date. I think too, the, oh, I, yeah, I think too, it's uh, where we land in this, in this last Sunday with the gospel of Mark uh, is this really interesting contrast of the disciples' uh, admiration of the temple, what large stones and what large buildings, and and then uh, and then the question: Tell us what uh, when will this be, and what will be the sign? It, there's an invitation here to interpretation, uh, to uh, making sense of what it what it is around us that is uh, indicative of God's presence and God's work in the world. And what is it that we are looking at? And what have we looked at uh, this past year and what will we look at going forward? And so it's, uh, it, may, it might be a, a call to uh, remind us that, that that's in part what we are about as followers of Jesus, as as disciples of Jesus, of this uh, this constancy of interpretation, and who is it? Who it? Who is it around us that? And who is it? Who who do we gather with? To uh, and particularly in a time when uh, when it might be that access to God or the revelation of God is does not necessarily has not necessarily happened in those expected places, uh, in in our um, absence um, from from our church buildings or the usual uh, kinds of discipleship activities. I think that's been the, I think that's been more challenging for people. Uh, so, uh, it yeah, it's a it's a call attention to a life and particularly. The location of of this, then what will be the sign? Then going into chapter fourteen uh, and fifteen, and so how will we? It's a the the sign is looking back, but it's also of course looking forward. And what? How is it that the disciples will interpret the signs that are to come, which are are going to be um, pretty. <laughs> <laughs> significant and uh, and what are they going to what are they going to mean then and you we interpret signs based on context based on past and based on present uh, and and where that where those signs direct us uh, then is the uh, is the mystery sometimes yeah I appreciate the look back at the last year that you're talking about. Caroline, I mean, not just in terms of Mark's gospel, but also now what you just said in terms of the times that we're living through, you know, a text like this often turns off preachers and congregations because you think this is so weird, this is so disturbing, but to, uh, for a lot of us, we're, we've never been better situated to interpret a text like this <laughs> because we've just spent coming up on two years now, churches, Christian communities trying to figure out how do you interpret a pandemic? Right, what does this mean for us? Not that anybody's saying, is this a sign of the end? Or I'm sure some people are, but they don't talk to me. But you know that. But what does it mean to sit down and talk to your children about why you can't go to school or why you have to wear a mask or why your grandparents have died suddenly? Um, and just to think about how we're interpreting a world that is but it always has been so perilously close to slipping into <laughs> you know, chaos. Uh, and for some people they're like, yeah, no kidding. That's how I live my life all the time. But what does it mean to live in a pandemic as well that's been um, intensified by, uh, at least in the United States, by, um, by racist realities. It's been intensified by the political climate. Um, it's been intensified by by certain kind of aspects of the American ethos that that have made it very difficult to love your neighbor. Um, I mean, we we can talk about this now a little more honestly or a little with more experience than we have in past years, I think. Um, I for the sake of then, for where do we go now, or where is Jesus in the midst of this? 
I agree with you totally. And um, in your in your last uh, a set of categories, if we change uh, how American has uh, has lost the ability to 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 love our neighbor and to simply to say how nationalism, wherever your national national identity is. Um, I, I, I'm just, I want to highlight what you said. For us, we may very well be at the most ideal time for understanding and interpreting and proclaiming the message of this passage um, in a way that's so similar to the context in which it was written. Do we dare take a look at Daniel from this? We have to. Yeah, we do. We do. Um, I do appreciate uh, uh, Chris Hayes' commentary here in setting it in, the, in the, its larger context. It's always so important, particularly when you have a piece like this that is just, uh, I don't know, it's just odd. <laughs> it's, it's an odd reading. And yet, um, we too often will skip it um, because it's a difficult uh, passage uh, for us to read. And so uh, I like to, uh, and I, I'm, I'm really curious, um, I'm going to give a, 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 a push over to Rolf, because I'm really curious to what he might do with this. But whenever I'm reading Daniel, I'm always reading it against the dystopian novels that are written today. And um, recognizing that in ancient times, they had those kinds of writings as well. And those writings speak to a different way of being able to understand the reality of our world. And I just wonder if Ralph might have uh, some, uh, either a contemporary or as I know he does well to give us uh, the, the biblical background for this. Say more about reading the, the dystopian novels. Oh, just um, when I read Daniel, uh, it, it, just in terms of the exilic nature of it, um, it's written from the perspective of, quote unquote, uh, or it's written with attention to, quote unquote, one of our heroes, Daniel, who's actually one of the four Hebrew boys. I mean, if you go back to the, the very beginning, um, um, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we don't uh, pay attention to that. And um, here you are is in the midst of exile, in the midst of the greatest disruption for the people of God at that moment and they have to find a way to find hope they have to find a way to find God's presence and this promise which may sound like revelation um, it's apocalyptic it's but it apocalyptic apo I was doing so well with my speaking there for a moment but that word that my teeth can't spell apocalyptic writing is also like our contemporary dystopian uh, the problem our dystopian novels are generally not written, written from a theological perspective. And this is our opportunity, I, I think, to read this text with that theological truth. Yeah, I, I, was, I always like to um, distinguish between the, the world in the text and the world behind the text, and sometimes the world in front of the text. But so the, the world in the text, this is exilic. And so in that concept, text, you know, you're, uh, you're working with this incredible trauma that the whole people has experienced. The world behind the text, this is probably the last, well, sorry, it's surely the last of the Old Testament uh, books that was written down from about the year 167, when uh, the Judean, uh, uh, the Jews in Judea and Galilee are horribly oppressed by the Seleucids and uh, empire out of Damascus and experienced against that, it, it's, it's not even resistance literature. It's something far more than resistance literature. It's, it's the literature of a people who are being uh, uh, thoroughly oppressed. You know, at a certain time, it's against the law to, <clears throat> excuse me, it's against the law to own a Torah or keep Sabbath or circumcise your, uh, your, your sons. And um, in that, context to me uh it's it's really a brave sort of literature and i do think about today the language that some people are using about creating brave spaces and how this literature helped um 
the Jews create a brave space uh, in which they could uh, be faithful to God. And it does so by talking about um, God's agency in with and among those who are oppressed. And these would have been the stories that Jesus grew up on, the ancient stories that Jesus grew up on um, to be able to be what some people call resistant. About the semi-continuous, which is our last semi-continuous uh, until it comes around again next year. So uh, here we are. It's not all that continuous. <laughs> That's the sad thing. <laughs> it's no. This is a sad, <laughs> this is a sad place to end. I mean, yeah, because um, Samuel doesn't get born. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, you know, if this is, if you're doing this, uh, replace the Psalm with uh, Hannah's song, uh, with Hannah's song. Uh, yes, in chapter two. Yeah, I'm That's sorry, Samuel does get born, but it's, you don't really get, uh, the action, at least replace the psalm with Hannah's song in 1 Samuel 2 and tie it all together uh, in that bigger way. And here's what I would do. I would just not deal with Samuel at all and yeah. uh, forget about Samuel. And, uh, and let's talk about Hannah here. And, uh, and again, a, a, a kind of um, a focus on Hannah uh, and, and Ooh, this is another this is another passage. It's really I'm having a hard time with because um, the way in which uh, uh, women who have uh, struggled with infertility and uh, and that reality and and you've got uh, what's her name the, who's mocking her, uh, provoking her, which then um, Panina. Elkanah, huh? Panina. Panina, Panina, and then Elkana does nothing to uh, stop that. And so there's just a lot of <laughs> troubling dynamics in this story that make me want to not, I don't, I don't really care too much about Elkanah right now or, um, or Samuel. And I really, really, really want to talk about Hannah. And, uh, and, uh, and where is her place in this semi-continuous year? Uh, and, uh, but also, as you said, uh, Rolf, to, uh, to bring in Hannah's song and the way in which she embodies a really critical uh, aspect of our scripture uh, that, uh, that the response to God's favor, uh, the response to God being favored by God and, and to, be, to be seen by God is praise. And uh, so we have her song of praise in chapter two, you could go back to Deborah's Song of Praise and Judges, but then it, on the cusp of Advent, uh, moving into uh, that, that, uh, that embodiment of, of praise with Elizabeth, uh, who has the same experience of barrenness, which will be the Advent text, and then uh, it, the, third, the, um, the last Sunday of Advent, and then, and then Mary with the Magnificat. And so uh, the way in which uh, Hannah is a, um, a, you know, a foremother <laughs> for Elizabeth and Mary in terms of her expression, uh, her, her giving thanks to God. So that, that's, where I would, um, that's where I would go. Totally agree. I, I would just add that uh, one of the interesting things that you discover is how often uh, in these Old Testament books, um, the uh, the action at the start of the book uh, begins with women. Uh, in some ways, you could argue that's true about Genesis. For sure, it's true about Exodus. For sure, it's true about 1 Samuel. Uh, you see it in Ruth. Uh, that You see it later in 2 Kings. And so um, that pattern is uh, really important in terms of how uh, the biblical narrative uh, views the agency of God's uh, beginnings. So one of my favorite sermons that makes this passage start uh, for me was a sermon that I heard many years ago uh, by um, uh, Jim Forbes. And uh, he uh, begins by saying that um, 
if his wife would have another child for him, and it was a girl child, he would name her Hannah Rose. And that's the ninth verse where uh, he's taking the subject and the verb and, and making it a name. And uh, I, I always love that, being able to point out that, that verse where it is Hannah that came in and prayed. It was Hannah that trusted in the midst of all that was going wrong in her life from uh, the other women in her life, from her own husband. And then the priest hasn't seen real prayer in so long. This isn't, I should stop and say, this isn't Jim Forbes, uh, because Jim just gave me the, the recognition of this brilliant name, Hannah Rose. Um, but in, the, in this midst of this moment, the priest doesn't recognize authentic prayer, authentic crying out to the Lord, and accuses her of being drunk. And, and so it's just heaped on um, being misunderstood, being displaced um, from the very places that she should find some sense of allyship. And, uh, and yet um, he's able to make a promise uh, of God, uh, maybe not out of great faith himself. Uh, and then, and, and then uh, she goes home with a different attitude and um, I, I just think that that's an important read of that particular text as well. Psalm 16. Yeah, so you know uh, Psalm 16 is the response psalm to the first lesson. If, if the first lesson is Daniel, it's a great text um, written from the perspective of one of the Levitical uh, priests who has no inheritance uh, in terms of land who has no portion in the land, uh, but then who is able to say, the Lord is my chosen portion, my cup, you hold my lot, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, I have a goodly heritage. Um, that is, from the perspective of one who doesn't have any of those things, confessing trust in God by saying, you are all those things to me. Um, yeah, I just, um, it's easy to spend life thinking about all the things you don't have that somebody else has, all the opportunities that you're never going to get that somebody else gets. Uh, the Psalm points us in a different direction uh, to focus on the blessings that we have. And most importantly, to focus on the power and blessings we have in God. And I know Skinner loves this Psalm. For so Who loves it? Matt Skinner. I love all the Psalms. <laughs> all 151. What, what stood out for me, what stood out for me in this one, and I don't know why I just caught it. And I have to say, I didn't finish going back to see how often these parallel words show up in other Psalms. Rolf, you may know this off the top of your head, but in verse seven and eight, um, I, I, I always think of the blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. And in this one, it is, I will bless the Lord. I keep the Lord always. I shall not be moved. Um, and that just really struck out in terms of what it means for us to call out our responsiveness to God in the way that God has been portrayed um, or revealed to us as the blesser, the keeper, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not the same word for keep, sadly. Ah. It's not the same word for keep as you get in the, the benediction. I'm, okay. pr I'm pretty sure about that. However, you know, bless, um, the word really should probably be translated praise here. It, it, uh, it's the word to kneel, literally. So it's about it's a, it's about worshiping. Um, yeah, it. But I do like how uh, that is reversed. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, I, 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 I knew I should. Have, I knew I, I should. Have, yeah, I knew I shouldn't have said it before I finished my homework. But no, <laughs> it, no, it's me. <laughs> well. I actually think um, I think you're right about um, that's how. 
hunches like that are how you do exegesis is you you notice things and you test them out and um and and sometimes they go places and sometimes they don't go where you want them to go yeah, and you, you know can't take them there. it's all right and our last reading from hebrews you know there's a lot of parts of hebrews that don't uh, really just kind of you know trip off the tongue aren't uh, at least for me uh, memorable, but I love the ending here. We're in chapter 10. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. I mean, right to there to me is, uh, that's a great, uh, sort of thumbnail of the Christian life. God is faithful. And that's what we confess that gives us hope for the future. And in response, we provoke one another to love and good deeds. I don't know about you guys, but my mom used the word, whenever she said provoke, it was usually something I was doing to my little brother that she didn't appreciate uh, that I was provoking him. Uh, but here it's provoking one another to love and good deeds. Uh, I don't know how you do that. You guys have any ideas? Oh, that's a tough one. But but uh, when this 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 end of this last you know this last passage in Hebrews, we are coming. I mean, we've talked about this at the way in which uh, Hebrews kind of cycles back on it back on itself uh, frequently. And you're like, wait, wasn't I just in this passage? But we do have uh, in this section some themes that we've been talking about throughout the Hebrews uh, throughout our discussion of Hebrews, like uh, for by a single offering. Uh, this is in verse. Uh, this is in verse fourteen. Uh, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So this idea of perfection and the the quote that you lifted up, uh, Rolf, is not unlike uh, you know the, the some of the other uh, quotes that we've lifted up that end up being on a you know on a needle point or a plaque in your office. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for uh, the ways in which uh, Hebrews does give us some really uh, significant language, uh, important language that, that, that is memorable for as much as it's, <laughs> it's repeti rep repetition, but is memorable and worth, uh, worth some reflection on as, uh, as we leave this book behind and move forward into Advent. 